Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Stone, the Marketing and Communications Manager at Downtown Cleveland Alliance. And I'd like to welcome you to the Downtown Now webinar series in partnership with Cleveland Magazine. After the panel discussion, we'll have a Q&A session. Throughout the webinar, you are welcome to submit your questions using the Q&A button on the menu bar. This way, uh, we'll have questions queued up and ready to go to start the Q&A session. Also, feel free to write your thoughts and comments uh, in the chat box, and we'll do our best to address your, your comments and, and thoughts throughout the broadcast. I will now turn it over to our Executive Vice President for Business Development, Michael Dima. Thank you, Jonathan, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who might be new to Downtown Cleveland Alliance, I wanted to take a few minutes to share a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, we are the only nonprofit organization dedicated solely to making Downtown Cleveland the region's most compelling place to live, work, and play. We are a place-based organization that represents <laughs> residents, businesses, as well as civic partners. And over the last 15 years, we've concentrated our efforts on building a clean, safe, welcoming, and pedestrian-friendly place that attracts additional investment. A place where residents and office workers can, meet, can walk to meet their daily needs, where local retailers and restaurateurs animate the streets, and where people are proud to build a life for themselves and their families. We cannot do this work without the generous support of individuals, small businesses, corporate partners, and foundation. And Downtown Cleveland Alliance needs your support now more than ever. In response to an outpouring of support and requests for ways to help, uh, we have launched the Unite Cle Recovery Fund. And this week we have a special promotion to support that fund. Uh, we are auctioning uh, packages for uh, 11 different staycations in Downtown Cleveland uh, at downtown hotels uh, and some of the uh, entertainment venues uh, and restaurants in downtown Cleveland. Uh, the bidding closes tomorrow uh, and you can find out more about the packages, the staycation opportunities and how to bid by visiting us at downtowncleveland.com. Uh, contributions uh, to the fund and proceeds from the auction will support small downtown businesses, aid our Voices of CLE mural program, expand our SEEDS workforce readiness program, which provides jobs and job training for individuals who are homeless, and sustain our Downtown Cleveland Homeless Fund, which helps us connect individuals who are homeless with shelter and needed social services. As Jonathan mentioned, uh, we launched the Downtown Now webinar series about three months ago, and I'd like to thank Cleveland Magazine and Community Leader, our media sponsors for this project. Since 2018, the Downtown Now insert in Cleveland Magazine has served to highlight the progress of downtown Cleveland. And we've used the webinar series to chronicle a rapidly changing environment, uh, to talk about the challenges related to COVID-19, our response to the recent outcry over racial injustice, and to deliver resources and updates from voices across the downtown community. Today, we're going to talk about the work taking place to invigorate the districts that make up the downtown neighborhood. When we say Downtown Cleveland Alliance is an alliance, we really mean it. Particularly in times like these, uh, we rely heavily on neighborhood-based partners to build the unique districts that make downtown an interesting and authentic place that is clean, safe, welcoming, and investment ready. We're joined today by leaders of our founding neighborhood partners, the Historic Warehouse District, the Historic Gateway Neighborhood, and Playhouse Square, along with a newer strategic partner, the Campus District. Uh, so I would like to uh, thank our panelists for joining us today. Tom Einhaus, uh, Vice President of Facilities and Capital at Playhouse Square. Uh, Tom also serves as Chair for the Board of Directors of the Downtown Cleveland Improvement Corporation. Welcome, Tom. Uh, we're also joined by Mark Lamon, who serves as Executive Director of the Campus District. And we're joined by a man who wears many hats, uh, Tom Yablonski. Uh, who serves as executive director of both the Historic Warehouse District and Historic Gateway Neighborhood, and also serves as executive vice president for Downtown Cleveland Alliance. Welcome, Tom. Good afternoon, Michael. Uh, Tom Einhaus, I'd like to begin uh, with you uh, in, in some uh, recent news. Uh, over the course of the last week, Playhouse Square uh, announced a, a new real estate partnership, and uh, I think would like you to talk a little bit about Playhouse Square's role in real estate and why in this this pandemic when there's so many questions and so much uncertainty um, about 
what the future of work looks like and what the future of urban places may be, uh, Playhouse Square took the step of bringing on a new real estate partner. Well, a little background on our real estate ventures. Um, we really have three stages that we work on. It's the performing arts, it's community outreach and education, and developing, or developing our neighborhood. So in developing our neighborhood, um, we own real estate strategically. We don't just go out trying to own everything that there is to own, um, but we own those properties that we feel we can make the greatest positive impact with. Um, in that, we have a million square feet of commercial real estate in addition to the Crown Plaza Hotel, the Playhouse Square Garage, and now the addition of the Lumen, which I think we're going to be touching on, plus a new 550 car garage related to that. Um, the recent partnership that you refer to is our partnership with um, Wakefield Cresco um, and the Cleveland operation. Um, we've been looking at our uh, leasing carefully over the years. Um, we've had some changes in staffing. And we really felt um, after looking at the market that they would be really strong partners. So we're, we're really excited to have them in. Um, they're gonna give us a lot of exposure. We have um, opportunities, new opportunities with the, with the pandemic. Um, we're gonna have to look at things creatively and they are a very creative team. Um, we are going to continue the property management side of the business and we feel that our property management services will be complementary not only to what we're doing here, but what they, what we can help them with as well. Uh, Tom, I'd like to, uh, Tommy Blonsky, I'd like to, to turn to you because, you know, one of the things I think that there's a, a, a perception uh, out there uh, about is that uh, there's not as much to do uh, in, in downtown Cleveland now. There's not as much going on. Uh, and, you know, those of us who are spending our days uh, uh, working uh, day in and day out here, we, we know that's, that's not necessarily the case. And, and a lot of that is, is concentrated in the, the warehouse district and the gateway district. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about uh, some of the things that are going on in the neighborhoods uh, that people listening uh, and watching may be able to come down and participate in. Uh, thanks, Michael. One of the things that they can explore, we're in our 12th year of our Take Ike program, which is not just in Gateway in the Warehouse District, but there are actually 12 different tours. People can come down and take uh, through their electronic device on their own. We obviously don't have the in-person guided tour, but you can listen and go along and you will still experience the actors and actresses that tell the stories of very important Clevelanders. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And because you can go at your own pace, it's very different. So we estimate if you come down, this takes about 45 minutes to an hour. In July, we are highlighting the Playhouse Square tour, the Civic Center tour, which takes in the malls, and an early Cleveland tour, which is part warehouse, part flats. And then next month, we're going to go back and have the uh, historic warehouse district tour. One thing that really highlights Euclid Avenue, our historic downtown department store tour. So a number of, and, and our canal basin tour, which leads to one of the other activities is we, as things have slowed down, you can still go for a walk and experience some of the trail development that's happening in or near downtown and quite exciting. Our towpath trail is coming to fruition. Well, Mark, our, a lot of our uh, viewers may be less familiar with the, the different uh, parts of the, the campus district. And it, it's a part of downtown where we've seen a, a lot of development activity uh, over the last couple of years and even in, in, into the pandemic. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the campus district and uh, some of the development activity that has continued uh, through the first half of this year. Uh, thanks, Michael. So. Campus district represents about one third of the total downtown Cleveland land area. So the, the border is East 18th Street to East 30th, the lakefront to the valley or orange where the post office is. So quite a significant chunk, but it is different in, in many ways because a large portion of the neighborhood is made up of anchor institutions. And um, as campus district, we are an anchor institution driven organization. And those anchors are Cleveland State University, St. Vincent uh, Charity Medical Center, and Coyote Community College. And we are starting to add uh, Cleveland Metropolitan Housing Authority into that realm as well, because the southern end of the district 
uh, that is the majority of, of property owners. Uh, but if you look at, at the neighborhood, it, 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 we, we treat it as one district, but it, it, it is two distinct neighborhoods uh, that, that function off of each other. And the northern part of the district, the Superior Arts District, is where we're seeing a lot of um, interest in commercial activity. Uh, so one of the things I would say, uh, you know, because of the knowledge and depth of uh, some of the people on this call, Cleveland is, uh, I think, one of the premier cities in using historic buildings for rehabilitation with revitalization of downtown. Um, because we're so successful, many of the buildings in the central business district have already been converted and we've got a few more left. So there's a lot of interest in the, the next part, which is the Superior uh, Avenue Historic District with Tom Yavlonsky helped put together uh, several decades ago. So those former garment district buildings with, if you look at, are very similar to some of the warehouse district buildings are getting a lot of attraction for uh, potential commercial use, office use and residential use. So uh, <clears throat> with that, uh, we also have some public invest investment coming down the pipe. And literally that is Superior Avenue, the Midway. And this is a really attractive amenity to many of the commercial office uh, tenants that we're talking to because their employees can now all of a sudden connect into this bikeway network and on their lunch break can ride their bike down to the flats, now hop on the towpath and all of a sudden now they've got a 20 mile ride in. Very attractive for talent. Um, so we're, we're really seeing that. And at the same time, um, these buildings are actually occupied right now. So we, uh, we're, we're trying to be very proactive to look at the artist community and ensure that this district retains its funky vibe, so to speak. And if you look at a lot of districts like us, like the LA Arts District or uh, down in Dallas, the Uptown District, which had kind of had these buildings in Miami, it's the Wynwood District low rise buildings offer very attractive rents for artists. So trying to repopulate the district. So we retain both of the characteristics that make it so special. And, and I'll end on, on, on two other, uh, well, three other notes. If you look towards the campus district, like what we call the campus community side, that's the area south of Payne. Cleveland State is about to enter into their master planning process. So there's big changes potentially happening on that end. We know, well, as of right now in fiscal year 23, there's proposed interbelt dollars. So the East 22nd Street connection, which for us, um, you know, I'm sure we'll touch on it more in this or future discussions, uh, offers us an Visioning reconnection of the Southern part of downtown in, into the central business district. And then if you continue that, the redevelopment of the Metro campus at Tri-C and then down into uh, what is the, the campus district RTA station, the flats connection trails. So that's, you know, a lot of going, what's going on in a nutshell, but um, it's all very exciting in the district. No, th thanks for that overview. And uh, Tommy Bonsky, I want to come back to you. Uh, Mark mentioned uh, the Superior Arts Historic District and uh uh, alluded to the importance that historic districts have played in, in, in downtown's development. Uh, and this is obviously in, in your wheelhouse. Tom's going to be uh, uh, very modest, but for everybody watching, you know, Tom Yablonski really is one of the, the leading experts, not just in Ohio, but nationally on uh, historic preservation and, and redevelopment. Uh, and Tom, I want to tap into that, that knowledge and expertise and ask you to talk a little bit about um, the historic district strategy in, in, in downtown, how many historic districts we have, um, why that's been so important to downtown's growth, um, and then ask you to talk a, a little bit about our most recent effort in the Erie View District. Okay, let me, let me start off with the most current news. The state is about to announce the winners of the state historic tax credit for the current round. On Superior Avenue, we have a couple of applications that are very competitive. Uh, they have the potential to bring a lot of new jobs, which um, Mark mentioned. Uh, Cross-country mortgage is a potential to land in two or three of those properties. And I would say they have a good shot at winning. We have, uh, we kind of self-score the Cleveland applicants and we think they have a really good shot. That should be announced next week. We thought it was today, actually, but it's probably going to be next week. So that's the most immediate thing. Your second question about how many districts we have, uh, 
you know, the theory was a few years ago, well, we're running out of historic buildings downtown. And right after that commentary was voiced, we added the Superior Avenue District and we added, started working on two other districts on the west side of downtown in the, in the flats. So when those were all done, we had nine historic districts downtown. We have just recently added a 10th as a strategy for what you've worked on, the 912 district. Believe it or not, the Erie View Urban Renewal Area is over 50 years old. So although a lot of people don't see those buildings as historic, they are mid-century modern. So that's the newest trend in historic preservation, adaptive reuse. And they're also, um, as I said, 50 years old. So we have the intact phase one of Erie View Urban Renewal, and that will add some 26 buildings to the National Register that give us other opportunity where we have a lot of vacancy for some financing strategies for reuse. And one of our most important strategies, less known than the tax credits, is our historic conservation easement program. And we hold 14 easements along that Superior Avenue district alone, our program. So it's very critical to financing and maintaining these historic districts. Well, Tom Einhouse, I want to come back to you uh, because not only is uh, Playhouse Square part of uh, an historic district, but you've got a, a terrific example in the news uh, with the lumen of how the historic um, district. In, in Michael, I'm going to ask you to repeat because you went blank on me. Okay. Uh, and you look a little bit frozen to me. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I want to uh, piggyback off uh, Tom's uh, remarks about the hi historic districts, uh, because one of the things that we talk about a lot is how um, successful the adaptive reuse strategy has been in uh, repurposing uh, historic properties, uh, taking uh, obsolete commercial space uh, off the market, and really building a residential base and building a market for downtown living uh, that's helped get us to a point where we can start to see some new construction. And we have a terrific example uh, in the Lumen in the heart of Playhouse Square, which I know just moved its first residence in over the weekend. Wondered if you could tell us uh, a little bit about uh, the Cliff Notes version of the Odyssey of the project, but uh, now that it's uh, you're beginning to move residents in, uh, how uh, how that project is looking. Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. So that's a 20 year overnight success story. Um, we actually <laughs> endeavored to do that building when we first bought the Hannah building property. And remember before I mentioned that what we do is strategic, there was a strategic purpose in that back in uh, 2000 when we made that purchase. Um, well, we're bringing it online. We just brought it online last week. Our first residents moved in um, it's a 36 story building. It has 315 units, an incredible amenities deck at the uh, fifth level um, with outdoor grilling and a pool and all kinds of, of other uh, fitness amenities and conferencing. Um, we right now have 45 pre-leased and it's gonna go very strong. construct and have it's a very robust and uh, we're getting lots of interest uh, to come in and see it um there's really um there's similar things downtown but there's nothing quite like it with nuke and that height and with the, if you look at the exterior of the building the way it's all faceted um the views and the views from every suite are really quite spectacular well, it, it, we're congratulations on, on completing the project and uh, getting the first residents moved in. And, and again, we, we hope that's uh, the first of, of many uh, uh, surface lots that we see uh, developed with, with new, new construction. So congratulations on that. And, and speaking of the surface lot part, the other part I didn't mention is we've added a 550 car garage, which gives about 200 uh, spaces for the residential tower, 200 or more and the others to uh, take care of a, a growing parking need in the neighborhood for our other tenants. 
Uh, Mark, you're uh, you, the campus district neighborhood, uh, you know, directly uh, abuts Playhouse Square and has really, you know, Cleveland State University in particular has formed uh, a, a really uh, nice partnership uh, with the Playhouse Square neighborhood. And, and obviously Cleveland State's success is, is very important to the campus district. I uh, wondered if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what you're anticipating to see from Cleveland State uh, in the fall uh, as uh, school resumes and uh, what you're, you're planning to uh, and expecting to see from them in terms of um, uh, developments on the campus. Sure. So in, in terms of this fall, and let's uh, always add this disclaimer, this could change tomorrow. So if you're viewing this a week from now, uh, this isn't exactly what it may be, but um, about a little over 50% of classes uh, are scheduled to be held in person, um, which would, you know, bring back a sizable amount of students. Uh, buses will also be offered online. Um, and that goes for both Tri-C and CSU. So for example, uh, Tri-C, a lot of your technical uh, positions, nursing, we want them to have some clinicals, welding programs, the advanced manufacturing, they'll be able to come on campus and, and use the facilities, but 50% of the other classes will be online. Um, in terms of uh, residential, about 83% of the former residential uh, student population is scheduled to come back right now, and, and CSU has done a, a really fine job of uh, ensuring that physical distancing is available within all the residential halls. So we expect to see that back, which will help a lot of our retailers back on the street. Um, you know, frankly, like the Rascal House, uh, some of Tom's uh, eateries where we, we really do see a lot of the students crossing back and forth between the two neighborhoods. So they, uh, they rely heavily on each other. You know, CSU is... Um, embarking, like I mentioned before, on this master plan and over the last 10 years, well, uh, 12 now, ever since uh, we did Euclid Corridor, um, you've really seen a university transform itself into what was previously a, a commuter school, uh, for lack of a better word, into a urban university. And we see nothing but that growing um, in, the, in, in the future because Cleveland is a very attractive product. Um, if you look at some of the other uh, universities in Ohio, um, even Ohio State isn't directly in downtown. So we really see this as an opportunity to uh, present Cleveland as a different type of university product where you can move to the big city, but do it um, in an economical way. And uh, we really see that those developments continuing. And again, uh, how those developments reconnect in to uh, the campus district through the East 22nd Street spine. We always refer to that because it's really the only north-south connection street all the way through the district uh, with the inner belt. Tommy Blonsky kind of uh, picking up off of uh, some of the development activity planned in the, in the campus district. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been, been pleased about in, in downtown is that uh, even uh, through uh, the, the public health emergency that we're in. Uh, we've seen, you know, robust development activity continue uh, throughout downtown and uh, some new projects begin. And I wondered if you could share with us a little bit about the development activity that you're seeing in the warehouse district and gateway district and uh, some of the things that we may have to look forward to in the pipeline. Well, as I mentioned, the state historic tax credit program, uh, the previous couple rounds, we were successful. There's a project on Superior, right? Uh, about 21st and Superior that's residential that's going on right now and will open soon. Um, there's some other ones that have been studied for that. Uh, Mark's mentioned uh, that opportunity as the, as the economy changes there. So that loft development will continue. And then in, in the uh, Gateway neighbor, there's some big applications uh, that are still pending. The Original Ohio Bell Building on Huron is one tax credits. The Baker Building, Long East Sixth is one tax credit. So, and then we have a very interesting small building in Gateway right near the stadium, which was one of the original German banks of Cleveland, which is hopefully gonna win this round, the small tax credit. So this type of act, and there'll be a very uh, good coffee shop restaurant that will go into that facility. So neighborhood amenities continue. And then I mentioned earlier, we, um, you know, what's the proof of how successful it has been? We 
I know this number with Lumen's now even higher, but the last time I measured this, we had 88 residential addresses downtown and 60 of those were adaptive reuse. So it shows the success of those nine or 10 historic districts. So as you, the warehouse district helped facilitate right down the hill from them, an old River Road historic district, and now a uh, Cleveland's center historic district, which is where the towpath's coming through in the Columbus Road Peninsula. So there have been two recent purchases of buildings on that peninsula that are starting to be converted to housing. They'll be right near the trail. They'll be right near a quality of life issue. There's a lot of potential for adaptive reuse. Both those historic districts flank the proposed Canal Basin Park. And up from the park is the West Ninth Spine of the Warehouse District, where we still have one of the largest concentrations of downtown housing. And that's, you know, some of that will continue with new construction proposed for Flats East Bank. And it will also be complemented by hopefully winning more of these tax credits. We have a lot in the pipeline. The, the well is not dry. We were aware of at least 10 or 15 buildings that could be applying over the next three to four rounds. So stay tuned. And Tom Einhouse, I, I, I know your, your role is primarily on the, the, the real estate side of, of Playhouse Square, but I'd, I'd you know, be remiss if I didn't uh, you know, acknowledge uh, this is a very different time for Playhouse Square just that is, as it is for the rest of downtown uh, and, and ask you a, a little bit about uh, how uh, you see the remainder of the, uh, the year and, and into early next year playing out, whether you, you think there may be some opportunities uh, uh, for Playhouse Square over the next several months. Sure. And, and uh, just a little, and thanks for that, a little, a little uh, background too. Coming into uh, this year, we were going to hit 50,000 subscribers, which is the highest subscription base in the entire country. Not bad for little old Cleveland. Um, but I'm happy to say that even with that, our subscriptions uh, coming into the next season are pretty high up in the 30s right now. So that's terrific. Um, we've also had very generous support from a lot of our, a lot of our uh, guests helping us get through this time, which is very challenging. We're running uh, two scenarios. Um, one scenario is with very limited shows. Um, next to nothing and another scenario is with things coming back. What we're anticipating um, is that there will be some activity into the fall and winter um, yet to be determined. It'll be limited. Um, clearly we'll have to do some social distancing as we get into the larger auditoriums. That might be the only place that we can do things for now. It depends on what the, uh, what the presentation is. And then we, we uh, are, hoping optimistically that um, we're able to turn the corner and uh, start programming in early 21 and uh, hopefully get some Broadway and concerts back on the stages and start welcoming guests in with, with, uh, without too many limitations. So I think we're all hoping for the same thing for all of our, all of our businesses and, and livelihoods. So that's, that's kind of the plan. Nothing too certain, but lots of optimism. That, that, that passes for good news these days. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Something hopefully to look forward to. Yeah, it'll be, it'll get better, and we're coming back. I'd I'd, I'd like to um, you know kind of sticking with that that notion, pick up a couple um, things that that Mark and, and Tommy Blonsky have alluded to, uh, and ask you a follow up question, Tom Einhouse, perhaps as much with your your downtown Cleveland Improvement Corporation uh, chair had on as, as with your Playhouse Square chair uh, uh, had on. But, you know, uh, Mark talked a little bit about the Superior Midway and the, the bicycle infrastructure that's planned uh, for the campus district into the, the heart of downtown. Tom's alluded to the um, uh, the towpath trail and, and before the call started, you know, we were all talking about um, the, the progress along the towpath trail and, and, and what an asset that's become. And one of the things that's really struck us at, at Downtown Cleveland Alliance over the last couple of months is, uh, you know, just how much downtown's outdoor uh, recreational amenities uh, have been, uh, their values really been, been highlighted in this, uh, in this environment where people are looking for things to do, looking for opportunities to get outside. Uh, coming into the pandemic, uh, we'd done a number of uh, studies with partners that had identified 
our, our lack of bicycle infrastructure and, and dedicated lanes and those sorts of things as something downtown needs to work on. It feels to me like the last couple of months have, have really emphasized that, highlighted that, that need in our downtown. I wondered if uh, you could comment on that you know, from your, your, your chairmanship perspective, from a neighborhood perspective, uh, as a cyclist yourself, uh, you know, you know how you would characterize the the, the need and the importance of having uh, additional uh, bike infrastructure through and around downtown. Right up my alley. Yeah, I am a, a very avid cyclist. In fact, this year uh, we're going to be doing the ride from Pittsburgh to DC in a couple in a couple weeks. Um, the the cycling infrastructure that uh, Bike Cleveland has helped develop, and Tom, I know you've helped develop, um, is important. And all we can do is make it more robust. Um, it was amazing to me to come down here on last Saturday night, came down around eight o'clock, and there were people on scooters, there were people on bikes, there were people all over the streets, and there wasn't a heck of a lot of stuff to do, but people were out and about, and it was really impressive. So I see this as not only a commuter opportunity um, to enhance and having more bike commuters through the city. We have great pathways now coming from the east and the west and the south. Um, so to make that even more robust, to put more opportunities throughout downtown. Mark, I know you pretty much ride your bike to work just about every day that you can when there's not snow and ice on the road. Um, I think there's plenty of people that want to do that. So the more we can do to enhance that, I think the more we can do as uh, property owners and business owners to um, help with that um, as, as uh, tenants in the buildings, where can people take a shower? Where can people leave their bikes? Um, where can one lock their bike up on the street? Um, providing opportunities for that. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the future. It's, it's here, it's now. And yes, we absolutely need to support it and build on it. Mark, I don't, I don't know if yeah, Tom really set you up there. Why don't you jump in? <laughs> yeah, you know, Tom, Tom's right. And, and lately I've, I've made a point of uh, riding downtown every day, um, just as the weather's been nice. And, um, you know, one of the things that struck me on a recent ride was if there is any silver lining to this pandemic, it's that I hope we don't lose the feeling that we have of being able to ride our bikes into downtown and explore all these urban places because we have space. And I, I, I noticed it too, just like, uh, you know, I have the trailer to take my son behind the bike and it's just so nice to ride all over the city and, and have that experience. And, and the thing is, we know a lot of cities around the world have this all the time. And we have the, we have the land area in our city to make this a very, not very complicated situation to solve. And, you know, when you look at the Superior Midway that we, we touched on, we're not proposing reducing any parking. There's no proposed reduce of travel lanes. It's literally just paint and concrete. And to, to be able to do that throughout our city, uh, I think will we'll put us up, uh, well, will catch us up. I'll be honest, I think we have some catching up to do, you know, Indianapolis with, with the cultural trail that I know Tom uh, references a lot, uh, but we can do this. and. Uh, now's the time to have those conversations because I hope we don't go back to the way where uh, I feel like I'm going to get run over on a bridge. <laughs> uh, Tommy Tom Blonsky, you know, I want, want to ask you to talk a little bit about your, your work with um, the, the, the Towpath Trail in particular. And, and again, just picking up the conversation we had right before uh, the, the webinar started about uh, the current phase of the towpath trail ending in, in Canal Basin Park and what, you know, what you think that means for development in the warehouse district? Well, speak directly for Canal Basin Park. That's the either the end point or the beginning of the whole system. So we want where people arrive to be special. So to the point Mark makes about overcoming where we're, we're slightly behind, you know, the current Canal Basin Park footprint has two very underutilized parking lots that don't look so nice. So one of the victories we got recently was we got NOACA's board to agree to reallocate funds for the money we saved on stage four, which wasn't automatic and some people were opposed to it. They wanted to go to other projects to allow that to instead, since we save money, put it back into the amenity of the green space. So those parking lots will go away next spring and where stage four comes into our riverfront, there'll be a whole greenscape 
much like there's a little bit of a smaller greenscape right behind the Flatiron Cafe right now, but that'll all blend together and West Street will go mostly away, which bisects the site. And as Mark noted, and Tom from having ridden recently the Topaz Trail, you come off the Carter Road Bridge and you have almost like a, a Wizard of Oz experience where you come under a tunnel and up ahead of you is the city. As you come through, the city unveils before you and the park will unveil before you and you'll go right to our riverfront and right to the spot where the sewer district just recently also did a major upgrade, which gives us a chance for a riverfront boardwalk. And to be multimodal, to speak to the opportunities, Metro Parks has just agreed to put uh, boat slips there. So you will have the opportunity to bike, hike, boat, hit the river. So the ultimate uh, resolution of all those uses together will make that a very exciting place. And a real downtown amenity because we did a survey, which I've been around too long. It's now 20 years ago with the warehouse work. And it was right when we got the grocery store to go into, uh, right near the time where we got a grocery store to go into Constantino's in the Bingham building. But the highest priority these people wanted was access to Cleveland's Greenbelt Park Systems. And as Tom noted, Tom Einhouse noted, East and West, you have now the Edgewater Parkway from Edgewater all the way into downtown or the the Veterans Memorial Bridge. So all these things will ultimately interconnect and hopefully make our city very user-friendly and accessible to that level of uh, biking activity and hiking activity. Well, I'd, I'd like to pause for a moment and, and ask uh, Jonathan whether we have any uh, questions beginning to roll in from the audience or if we should keep going. Um, yeah, we have, we have a few that are, that are rolling in and I just want to re-remind everybody, if you have questions, now is the time to ask them and we'll, we'll do our best to get to them. Uh, the first question is for Mark, um, with all of the redevelopment happening, happening in the Superior Arts District, uh, what strategies are, it, or is the campus district employing to, um, activate the surrounding neighborhoods and strengthen uh, the physical connection to the rest of downtown Cleveland? Well, um, like most organizations, we've had to pivot a lot of our work during the pandemic. And, and one of the things that we are pivoting to is actually doing a master plan for the neighborhood. So believe it or not, Canvas District's actually been around since 1982. It was a police force for CSU, uh, St. Vincent, and Tri-C before they had their own respective security services. Um, they changed that in the late 80s, which is when the last master plan was done. Um, so one of the key aspects uh, that we, we want to implore with this master plan is sort of twofold. We want to embed uh, the arts into, into this district, so it remains an artist district, and also embed social services uh, into this district because uh, the community has made very clear um, that we are not going to try to move any of our social service agencies that the neighborhood has to grow around it. And then really looking at the linkages between St. Clair Superior, Midtown, and Burton Bell Car. And one of the one of the things that I've, I've been talking about, I don't have a better term for it, but I'm going to call it the opportunity pipeline, in that if you look at where CS, or I'm sorry, Tri-C is situated, um, if you look at Community College Boulevard and East 22nd Street up Euclid Superior, you should be able to go from, uh, from birth to get an education and get all your needs met into this area and connect it into the, the, the largest jobs hub in the state of Ohio, which is downtown Cleveland and the Central Business District. So figuring out how those, those sort of fibrous connections work, and it not, may not be strictly physical. We, we talk about bike lanes. Um, which are vitally important because we see how many people use, for example, the campus district rapid station, but because the walk is so bad, they will wait a longer period of time to get on the bus. So how can we strengthen those uh, things so that, <clears throat> excuse me, people have access to them, but also through programming. Um, we were really trying to explore um, some more programming in the neighborhood. The Southern part of the campus district is a food desert. How can we, engage with the community in that way. So we expect as we uh, move into this master planning process, which will occur this fall, we're going to really start 
thinking about how those linkages occur and the you know the theme that comes up constantly in our discussions um or at least i bring it up anyway is the inner belt uh, is sort of the ultimate physical red line um in our history so how we treat the inner belt which is not going to go away but how we relink the eastern neighborhoods into downtown so that they can access the, the resources, frankly, and the wealth of the central business district and sort of heal those wounds uh, from time. That's the real focus of what we want to accomplish with this. Okay. Um, and we're going to go over to Tom Einhaus. Um, we've mentioned, you know, the Lumen opening, um, but from a resident perspective, community spec perspective, uh, development perspective, what is the impact of having a, a, a large development project like the Lumen uh, being completed in, in opening up for uh, residents in downtown Cleveland? Um, I, I, I look at it as a, an important piece of an overall uh, residential component for downtown. Um, what's happened along the Euclid corridor, what really started out in the warehouse district um, which is which is now all through the Gateway District. I think it just continues to round out downtown as a residential community. Um, the vitality, we have quieter parts of town. We have more um, nightlife parts of town. Um, you know, this one in some ways work. Your crowd night it is um, the, where you have four. So I think about the offer, um, I think it's overall development of downtown and it further creates Playhouse Square as a destination. All right. Um, and uh, we know that there's a lot of development that's taking place along uh, Euclid Avenue. Um, and so the question is for Tom Yablonski, what are are the new developments um, or how are these new developments making downtown Cleveland more attractive for businesses and talent? Well, uh, our no man's land, so to speak, was we had all the renovation up to ninth and then Playhouse Square, but it's all being filled in. The Athlon, which is recently opened, the Euclid Grand across the street will be done by early next year. Uh, still very hopeful for the project of Centennial to get done and obviously the nine huge mixed use project. As all those are completed, we'll have no gaps between East 9th Street and Playhouse Square. And, and unfortunately we're interrupted by the COVID crisis, but we think that's a great grand retail street strategy for Euclid that we will have the largest concentration of downtown residential being right in that cluster of uh, the theater district on one end and the, and the public square, all the way between public square and the theater district, there, as I said, there'll be no gaps. So we should be able to, as a downtown, create quite an exciting environment for people to uh, have ground floor uses that really complement that level of neighborhood activity. That's our goal. That's what we want to see. And Jonathan, if, if I could interject, it, it reminds me of a, a conversation we had uh, several sessions ago when we had some of our downtown residents on on the webinar and you know we got to talking about uh you know what the impact on the desirability of downtown living was with you know no ball games no concerts no theater in the short term uh, no big events and uh it was it was interesting uh, to to a person on on the panel they all kind of said well the don't get us wrong. The, the, the events are, are nice. That's a, uh, uh, that is something that, that is uh, attractive about living downtown, but it was, um, you know, a lot of the things that, that Tommy Blonsky just alluded to the, uh, the historic, uh, architecture, the, just the unique environment, the, the, the green space, the convenience, uh, of being able to, to walk, uh, to meet, uh, daily needs and run daily errands, uh, was the thing that, folks found most valuable and we're continuing to find very, very, very valuable. Uh, you know, so I think one thing that, that this period of time has, has done for us is really uh, reinforced kind of that core value proposition of why people choose to, 
to live and, and be in downtown Cleveland. Okay, um, and we're, we're gonna go back over to Mark Lamon. Um, there's, the question is, there's a lot of, uh, or there, there's a large number of um, public housing and subsidi subsidized housing units in the campus district. Um, what is being done to uh, engage the residents who live in the campus district? So um, we, uh, we are, we've been very proactive about reaching out to the residents, especially those uh, in the old Cedar uh, project uh, or the CMHD project. Uh, if you'll recall, one of our first public art projects was the Bridge That Bridges, um, which if you haven't taken a look at it, was the East 22nd Street Bridge. We, uh, over the course of four years, created a public art project that focused on racial equity uh, in the neighborhood. So we've, we've engaged that way. Um, we also have uh, CMHA on our board. Um, so we, we try to direct a lot of, of resources that way. In addition, we're, we're tied in with the downtown Cleveland residents uh, group. So a lot of our, our properties along Superior Avenue, um, we were actually able to host an event there. But during this process um, that I talked about with the master planning and previously with our with our uh, task force groups, we, we met with a lot of the residents to kind of uh, understand what their needs were. And I alluded to that earlier with the food desert, the lack of recreational opportunities. So we can see a lot of what we've learned from the residents being incorporated into our future planning work. Um, and we hope to re-engage programming. Uh, this fall, we were really excited to uh, start a food truck event in the southern part of the, the campus district along East 22nd Street. Um, obviously not gonna be able to do that this fall, but hopefully we'll be able to do that in the spring and offer some fresh food uh, down there for everybody. Okay, um, and I think this is gonna be our final question before we have you know, our, our last words. Um, uh, what is the plan for scooters downtown? Um, moving forward, I'm all for using uh, the new modes of transportation, but there seems like there's been some misuse. So what, what would be the plan for scooters going forward? Just maybe where I, where I go ahead and, and, and jump in. This is a, a topic of conversation right now uh, at, at DCA. Uh, we, we, you know, very much value having a, a, a variety of transportation options for getting into and around downtown and the you know the scooter program and the bike bike share program uh fit that bill very very nicely that said you know we are working you know very closely with uh, the city and uh the scooter companies to try to identify uh technology interventions that might uh encourage uh, uh, people to obey the law follow the rules that are in place uh for the scooters which are not supposed to be ridden on sidewalks. People are supposed to wear a helmet uh, and, and those sorts of things. Um, so I think there's an educational component. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll work with writers, work with uh, business owners and property owners in the city to try to uh, raise more awareness about uh, what the rules are, identify technology interventions that encourage following the rules. But I also think it goes back to the conversation that we had a little, uh, a little bit earlier about uh, the need to improve uh, bike infrastructure in downtown, the need for um, uh, bike lanes, protected lanes, a, a place that feels safe for people to uh, ride scooters or ride bikes, uh, whichever the case may be. And I think that's one of the things that's lacking right now that's leading to some of the um, less responsible behavior. Um, well, I know Jonathan said that maybe the last question from the audience I'd like to take an opportunity uh, to uh, give each of you a chance to, to uh, share some closing remarks. Um, and I, I guess I'd, I'd share the, the same question and throw it out to, to all three of you. You know, as, as we're, we're sitting here in a very challenging time, uh, we're all, uh, you know, struggling to, you know, try to help uh, our, our businesses uh, in across downtown and all the neighborhoods. Um, stay afloat, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're working with, uh, we're hoping to have uh, events come back at some point. We've got uh, baseball coming back tomorrow, but there won't be as many people as you, you, you see in the, the photo behind me. 
Um, uh, but we know that we're in a cha- we're in a challenging time. Uh, there's some uncertainty ahead of us. We're all reading things about what the future of work is going to look like, what the future of cities is going to look like. And I'd like to ask each of you from your leadership positions to share your perspective about, you know, what you think downtown Cleveland and your neighborhood are going to look like on the other side of this. Uh, and Tom Einhouse, I'll begin with you. Okay. Um, I, the, uh, my favorite analogy is that we're, we're in a very stormy sea on an extremely seaworthy boat. Um, everything that's happened in Cleveland, and, and I hate to say it, but I've been doing this for 40 years now. Um, and Tom Glonsky, I think you've been there just as long. And everything that's happened in Cleveland and all the important work that everybody on this meeting has done has, has created a wonderful base for what's happening. You know, the fact that, you know, some just glorious things is filling in the gap between Playhouse Square and 9th Street. I mean, that, that stuff doesn't just happen. There was a lot of momentum that got that there. I feel that momentum is very strong. I think it's strong throughout the entire city. Um, you know, I'm not going to be silly about it. Yeah, there's going to be challenges. There's going to be small businesses that are going to be struggling to get back open, and we're going to have to come to their aid and help figure this all out. But I think we have an extremely strong base, a lot of extremely positive momentum, and I have no doubt that we're going to get through this. We're going to recover from this and that we're going to be fine and we're going to be more efficient. We're going to be stronger for it. Tommy Blonsky, I'd like to get your perspective on the same question. Yeah, I have to say, I hope to now steal Tom Einhouse's analogy. I agree. We're very <laughs> seaworthy. I think so much has been built up. When you made the point about why would you come and live in these places, there's no ball games, there's no theater. And I think those things will come back on the other side. But the environment that's been created, it's what people see. Authenticity matters. We've, we've saved our historic buildings. We've renovated them. We have beautiful streets, potentially. We can augment them and make sure they maintain better. We have a riverfront and a lakefront. So you talk about waterfronts. We have such unique assets and things are very close by. Uh, I mean, even by the new Edgewater Parkway, Lake Edgewater Park's very close by. The river valley to get to the National Park, the Topaz Trail, is those things are very close. And now even the county is working on augmenting that with long-term connecting the whole lakefront up with accessibility. So I think we've we know the problems. They're not, you know, it's not that they're not there, but this community has proven we've taken what was once a great city and taken those assets that got developed and redeveloped them and reused them again. And I think a lot of places would, would you know, kill to have what Cleveland has. We have it. We just got to work hard not to lose it. And Mark, I guess you are going to have the final word. Um, I, I, I'm bullish on downtown. I, I think the, the foundations that we've laid uh, over the last 15, 20 years longer have led us, uh, have enabled us to have a city that's actually, I feel like weathering the pandemic better because we have these nice green spaces where uh, our staff will will meet at Mall B or we'll meet at a park and sit up far and that's our staff meeting and that's what you can still do downtown. And um, I think all the investments that we're making will, uh, ensure that future, I think, but we're also, you know, using this time uh, to plan for the future. And uh, I will say, you know, sort of two things in closing, when when the pandemic happened, uh, you know, the campus district, for example, really rallied around, you know, how do we protect the most vulnerable in our community? You know, the campus district is home to the two largest homeless shelters in the state of Ohio. And with the county's leadership and others, we're able to figure out some social distancing strategies but also working uh, with our other neighborhood partners like Ohio City Campus District was able to put out public uh, restrooms and hand washing stations in the district so that we ensured that we weren't gonna uh, have, a, have a spread. Um, so I think just that resilience um, that you know we're getting through this, uh, 
will ensure that we have a, a healthy, strong downtown. And frankly, I, I don't know about all of you, but I, I'm tired of social distancing. So I look forward to the day where I'm back downtown and I bump into the, the, the five people I'm seeing and four people I'm seeing in front of me right now. And we have these conversations that uh, begin uh, with the next project. What's the next towpath? What's all this? And I think, you know, our downtown has been uniquely positioned to weather this, weather this storm in a, in a good ship uh, in a way. And I, I look forward to coming back even stronger. So. Well, I, I, I appreciate those closing words uh, from, from each of, of you. And, you know, I, I, I share uh, the optimism and I, I think I, you know, also share the realism that, that all of you have that, um, you know, the next year or so is, it's going to be a grind uh, to get to the other side of this. Uh, but certainly agree that the other side uh, is uh, going to look much like you described. Uh, I, I think we're all going to run with Tom Einhouse's analogy of the, the seaworthy ship. Uh, and I'm uh, grateful to have uh, leaders like you in downtown to work with, to grind through the pandemic that we're in so we can get to that um, uh, brighter light on the, on the other side of this. Uh, and just know that you, you've got a strong partner in downtown Cleveland Alliance uh, that will be there working uh, with you in your neighborhoods as well. So thank you again for your, your thoughts. Thank you for your time uh, this afternoon and participating in the webinar. Uh, thanks to everybody in the audience who tuned in to listen, and uh, we're grateful for your support, and we hope to see you next week at three o'clock for the next episode of Downtown Now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. True pleasure. Thank you.